morning, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday. So good to see you. Let's stand together. These words were written by the prophet Zechariah 500 years before the birth of our Messiah. He writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Come on, church. Now is the time to worship. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven.
We'll just continue our worship now. Sometime today, David. Welcome to Misty Creek Community Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Street, and it's an honor to welcome you here. Whether you're in person with us today, watching online with us, welcome to our online viewers and those outside enjoying that gorgeous weather under the tent. We are glad that you're here. So thankful for our amazing worship team led by our worship pastor, Doug Allen. All glory to God. Our amazing tech team, we just are so thankful for what you guys do for us. We really do appreciate you. We have a lot of guests here today, and if this is your first time with us, and we know we have a lot of first-time guests, I encourage you to visit one of our welcome stations. We have one right inside the door there with Miss Lolly, and we have one right outside the door with Miss Marcia. And if this is your first time today, you get a free gift from the church. It's a really cool cup. With all kinds of things in it. It's a designer cup, so I hope you'll enjoy that. I want to I wanna make a special welcome to a lot of our guests that are here today. I want to welcome our first-time guest who will be singing in our service in just a few moments. Um, Vivian Wilson's here today. Hey, Vivian. And her mom and dad are here. Camille and Bo are here, and we're thankful for them. And uh, lots of friends and family from Wesleyan School, and glad that you're here with us. And uh, Vivian is a, a voice student of my wife, Karen Street, right here, and we're just, we're just glad to have her with us and all the guests that she brought with her today. And if there are other guests, we're glad to have you as well. A couple of things I want to bring to your attention. I will not go through all the announcements. You're like, thank you. 
okay? You have an insert in your seat there that tells you everything that's going on in the life of the church. But I do want to highlight just a few of those things. Next Saturday, next Saturday, April the 8th, from 10 to 2 p.m., we're having our third annual Easter extravaganza. Does that not sound amazing, you guys? And you're, you're invited to come to it. Think about that. From 10 to 2 o'clock. That's a long time. Lots of crafts, lots of activities. Of course, Easter egg hunts. And congregation, we want you to respond and help. And uh, Miss Molly has instructions for you at the desk back there how you can be involved providing eggs and other things. Our youth group will be assisting with that amazing day as well. So we just pray for really good weather as we expect a wonderful turnout for that. Also wanted to let you know that our next men's Bible study. And the reason I'm going ahead and highlighting this, it starts on April 17th, but Reagan wanted me to let you men know that that night, get ready for this, we're having a low country bowl. Women, you're jealous, aren't you? Yes, yeah, it's men only that night. Yeah. So hopefully you'll be a part of that. If you turn to the reverse side, there is a lot of stuff going on Easter. I hope Doug and I have rested a lot because we're going to need it. The, we're going to need it this week. Let me just go ahead and tell you about it all. There's a video you can watch online, but I just want you to know about these services. So on April 6th, it's Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m., and our teenagers are going to have leadership in that service, and they would really love to see you here as we commemorate Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, so that'll be here at 7 p.m. We're going to have a Good Friday service on Friday, April the 7th at 7 p.m., and that's the last seven words of Christ, and we're going to actually have seven folks from our congregation that will do a meditation on each one of those sayings of Jesus from the cross. Very, very meaningful service. I've already told you about the Easter extravaganza. I do want to tell you about our Easter Sunday uh, services. We'll have a sunrise service at 7 a.m., and at that service, our, our youth girls, young adult girls and teen girls, are going to be presenting a phenomenal dance uh, to a beautiful song right outside at 7 a.m., and after that, to really encourage you to come, we're going to have Waffle House for breakfast. I thought you would do something about it. See? I think that's deserving of a sound effect, don't y'all? There you go. I thought you'd enjoy that. Thank you, Josh. And then at 1030, and this is no pat on the back by any means, but I have been meeting with Doug, and we have been rehearsing with our worship team and our praise singers for the service that will be in this facility at 10.30 a.m. It is going to be off the charts, anointed, dynamic, holy, powerful, folks. Please come. It's at 10.30 a.m. You're going to get here early. We're going to fill this place up. We're going to fill up outside. We'll have the big tent up outside. It's going to be a glorious celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can't wait for that. And last but not least, you may have been hearing about our attic treasures. This is our main fundraiser for our Ecuador mission trip, and we would love for you to read this article that's in the insert today. We'll have a lot more information coming out to you soon, but go ahead and get this on your calendar. It's a big deal, and we would love for you to be a part of that and support our Ecuador mission team that's made up of teens, young adults, and adults from the church. It's not a youth group trip. It is a church-wide trip to Ecuador mission trip for uh, Jungle Kids for Christ. A lot of stuff today, but I just wanted to make sure you knew what was going on in the life of the church. I'm so thankful that you're here. God bless you. I'd like everyone to turn around and look at the stained glass windows that we've never seen in this church. The back, two back in the corner behind the tech team. They, they were, they've been covered up from orbit for ever since we've been in here. And just a reminder, before we bought this facility, um, they were ready to take out these stained glass windows. So can you believe that? They've been here since 1950. Um, but they were going to take them out. So praise God that uh, we were able to buy the building. Um, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen wanted a big announcement today. The two things we're going to talk about real briefly is that Orbit is 98% they have 98% of the stuff out of the building. Um, they still have a piano downstairs and a few other things, but they'll be getting that out this week. Um, it's, it's incredible how much stuff they had in here. We, were, we wanted to give you a big surprise today when you came in. We wanted to have all of these, th all of these walls knocked down and all this space open, uh, but they were here all day yesterday taking out their stuff. So we'll begin to work on that project uh, relatively soon. 
Um, we want to give you an update on the, um, we don't have the pricing update. That was the big, we wanted to be able to tell you today what the price of the new um, phase one will be, which is the site work, the playground, the pavilion. Um, probably the most exciting thing, and I, I think we should all say hallelujah about this, is it's going to include two restrooms on this floor, right? You won't have to walk downstairs to go down anymore, so praise God. In addition to those things, and again, we're going to have, uh, we should have firm pricing on the, uh, from the contractor the week after Easter. So uh, we'll look forward to sharing that with you when we get it. In addition, uh, we're going to put a new front door on the building. Uh, we're going to put a, I can't remember the size of the screen, Reagan, how big is the screen? Six by we're going to put a six by ten screen up here so that you don't have to break your neck looking at these uh, screens every day. So we're going to do that. We've already ordered that screen. And then the other thing we, we've talked about briefly is we're going to begin the demo to, to bring this back to a church instead of a black box theater. So, um, you know, we'll begin that process relatively soon this week. So um, I wanted to really be able to give you numbers today on, on, on how much it was going to cost to do the phase one, but we don't have that, and I'll circle back with you in a couple of weeks. But praise God that we have the building, and praise God it's orbits out of here. So thank you. Tom, appreciate that, brother. Good morning. How's everybody doing? So good to see you. Before we continue our worship, let's uh, let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. And as I most times begin my prayer, we welcome you here, Father God, Jesus the Son and Holy Spirit. Have your way in this place. Have your way amongst us. Have your way in our hearts this morning. Blessed are you, Jesus, who came to us in the name of God Almighty. And may we remind ourselves right now of who you are, Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile himself in all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You were the word in the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You're in glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ, what a beautiful name.
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We invite now our children to go with Miss Molly and Miss Rhonda and Mr. Stephen for Creek Kids. Woo! Wow. I've got to go after that. Um... <laughs> I wish she was still here to thank her for sharing the gift that God gave her for glorifying him in our space today. So thank you, Vivian. Now let's go together and continue to worship God in prayer. Palm Sunday, the day our Lord rode triumphant into, into Jerusalem. John twelve thirteen, uh, and we read, They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Father, they celebrated your son as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, a symbol of peace, and the palm branches, a symbol of victory, triumph, peace, and eternal life. Oh, the joy of those following and honoring him. And yet Jesus knew what was coming. At the end of that week, Jesus, your perfect son, laid down his life for us, took all our sins upon himself to give us eternal life. There is no greater love that is lavished on us. Lord, we pray for that same joy of Palm Sunday to reside in our hearts every day, that the joy of who you are is uppermost in our minds as well as our hearts, especially when we are faced with the horror of evil that happened this past week in your church in Nashville. Our hearts break for the families, friends, and community, grieving for loved ones in the senseless act of violence that took place there. We also grieve for the families of the nine service members who perished in the helicopter crash in Kentucky. Surround them all with your comfort and care. Strengthen those you have called to minister to them. We pray for the needs in our church, for the concerns we have shared, and for those unspoken on our hearts, for healing, comfort, and peace. Father, we struggle in this fallen world, but we know you understand better than we do. And you say in Hebrews, for, or we read in Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest that is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Merciful Father, as we enter Holy Week, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him with our lips, 
but may follow him in the way of the cross. And now let us continue to worship together as we pray as Jesus, Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, it is, and is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. 
hey, this is the Palm Sunday road that Jesus walked into the city, his triumphal entry. You might remember riding in on the colt and everybody laying down the palm branches. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Woo! I was there. I walked where Jesus walked, you guys. And guess what? You can learn more about where we walked, what we saw, what we did today at 4 o'clock at the Menifees. Robert Dick, Chuck Trentz, and Joy Percival are going to do their Holy Land recap and not only we're we doing that. Now that's that's primary, secondary, but a very close secondary. We're having an ice cream Sunday bar, featuring oatmeal cream pie ice cream, bluebell vanilla ice cream, Rocky Road ice cream, strawberry ice cream with all the toppings. Yes, you won't hear another thing I'm going to say today, will you? Well, I'm glad that you're here today, and what a day to be here! Wow. God is moving in a mighty way through the authentic presence of His Holy Spirit, and you are a part of that. And He's, he's glad you're here. He really is. So, it is Palm Sunday. And before we go to Palm Sunday, we're in a series, for those of you who are, who are new to us or maybe haven't been here in a little while, we've been doing a series now for almost six weeks called Jesus into the Wild. In the very beginning of that series, we gave the congregation a book called Jesus in the Wild. And they've been reading that book all about Jesus, beginning at his baptism by John the Baptist in John chapter 3. It's when Jesus goes to the Jordan River, been there too, and he's baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And it's when he is in that water, he comes out of that water, the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove, and a loud voice from heaven proclaims, This is my Son, my beloved, and whom I'm well pleased. So we could say this is the beginning of Jesus' journey. This is where Jesus learns about his calling. The Latin word for calling, for vocation, is vocare. It's what God has called you to do. It's not your job. It's not your career. It's your vocation. What God has called you to do. So it's revealed to Jesus as he comes out of that Jordan River who he is and who he belongs to. His identity. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And everybody that's present there, you know, you got your religious leaders that are there. You probably got some Roman folks that are there. You probably got your outcast, your low class, your middle class. A lot of people are there, and they hear this, and they witness this. But what happens almost immediately after Jesus receives his identity? Well, the Spirit leads him into the wild, the wilderness, where he is tempted by the Satan for 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, and when he comes out of that wilderness, he's hungry. And that's part of our lesson today. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. But let me give you just a little brief recap of where we've been going the last six weeks that leads us to Palm Sunday and what we consider as Holy Week or Passion Week. So I'm going to take you there just for a few moments. And we're going to start where Jesus is tempted. He's tempted on an empty stomach. It's hard enough when you're tempted and you've got a full stomach. But he has willingly chose not to eat anything during this time to be totally open to the Spirit. After all, it's the Spirit that's led him to the wilderness, not Satan. And we can refer to Satan 
Not as this little red man or this little demon that sits up on your shoulder here. You know, you got the evil one over here and you got the angel over here and they're battling it out on your shoulders. You may have seen that cartoon before. You may have heard Satan referred to as Beelzebub, the prince of darkness, the evil one. But in our context, the Satan is the enemy of the soul. And all of us have that enemy of the soul. The competing voice trying to distract us from our vocation, from our call. And Jesus wasn't going to have any of that. When Satan tempts him and he says, you know, I know you're hungry. Why don't you command this stone to become bread? I mean, that's some kind of temptation if you have not eaten, right? Warm, gooey. Soft bread. Kind of like the bread that you get, maybe Olive Garden. Or if you're going to step it up and you're one of those buckhead people and you go over to the Atlanta fish market, uh huh. You know, you got to ask for it and they'll bring it to you. Or you might be like Lamar Wright and I. We just like good old fashioned sunbean or marita white bread, right, Lamar? And we had some last night. We took the youth group, the Sky Zone. It's amazing that I'm standing before you today. (laughs) Because for two hours last night, I was jumping on trampolines. And I would show you the video, but I don't want to show off of me jamming the ball. You know, I have redefined uh, Scripture a little bit. And we know we don't do that here at, at, at Misty Creek, but I must tell you my own personal verse. I jam, therefore I am. So we had that bread at Dreamland Barbecue last night that you dip in the sauce. Oh, my goodness. And I believe, Joshua, I I think I counted, I think it was seven slices that you had, something like that. And then he still ate these loaded fries with barbecue and cheese on them and a side of banana pudding. What I haven't told you is that I took his leftovers and I had them last night myself before I went to bed. So this is the temptation that's presented to Jesus. And he responds With it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Well, Satan's like, "Ah, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. He He shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, let's remember that Satan only has power on the earth. He has no power in the heavenly realm. You know, in the present evil age, He has power, but he only has power if you give him power. That enemy of the soul that's teasing you, drink this, smoke that, put this in your body, say this, do that, you know, almost like a whisper. If you do this, you'll feel good. If you read this, it'll direct your life. That sort of thing, you know. If you stay out real late at night and party all night long, and skip church the next day. Don't worry about it. You'll make it up at some other time. That's the enemy of the soul. Jesus will not have any of that. So when the Satan shows him all the earthly kingdom and says, this can be all yours, Jesus, if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says it again. He says, it is written. Worship the Lord and serve Him only. You see where he's going with this? He's going all the way back to Deuteronomy. He's going all the way back to when the Israelite people were wandering in the desert. And they wandered because they kept whining and complaining instead of following and trusting God's lead. Do you ever feel like that? You feel like you're just wandering, going around in circles, and your life is just like doing a 360. You know? You're not getting anywhere because you're not trusting and leaning into the Lord and His his vocation, His will for you, His plan for your life. And so Jesus, He's not going to give in to another one of His temptations. And then the Satan leads him to the highest point of the temple. Now, that makes me say, hmm, can you do that with me? Hmm, Jesus let the Satan lead him somewhere? 
Interesting. We need to remember that Jesus is also human. This is called the dual nature of Christ. He's 100% divine, but he's also 100% man. Okay? 206 bones covered by more than 18 square feet of skin, countless muscles, organs, and a heart that would beat on average of 176,000 times a day until it beat its last at Golgotha. But it never stopped loving. He didn't give in to that temptation that Satan was throwing out there at him. Instead, he responds, it is written. Now, there's an important word that we talked about that I don't feel like we spent enough time on through all of these temptations. It's the word if. If you do this, if you command this, you know, Satan is telling, if you will jump off the pinnacle of the temple, his angels will catch you. And Jesus says, nope, I'm not going to do that. It is written, you shall not test the Lord thy God, or tempt him, some translations say. So Jesus is not going to let the Satan get in the way of his calling his journey. Instead, Jesus is going to be so full of the Spirit that when he comes out of that wilderness, he will be ready to begin his itinerant ministry. You're like, what is itinerant? His traveling ministry for the next three years. He'll come out ready to eat. He's going to be hungry, but news is going to spread about him quickly. He's going to call his disciples He's going to begin his ministry of teaching and healing and proclaiming the Word of God, which, by the way, the Word of God became flesh through Jesus. So you and I have a choice with this word, if, that the enemy of the soul, the Satan, throws out to you. Now, Jesus uses that word, if, to bring you closer to him. If you will love me, if you will love others as I've loved you, if you will pray, if you will make a difference for me, great is your reward. And your reward may not necessarily be on this earth. The reward is eternity. Do you know if you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you're sold out for him and you serve him, that you already have the promise of eternity within you right now. You've been given the keys of the kingdom. Yes. And as you grow in Christ, as you mature in your faith, the more you become like him. And the if becomes positive. But Satan will use the if to destroy you, to cause you to question yourself and doubt who you are. Things like, if I wasn't divorced... If I was married, if I wasn't hurt, if I hadn't been betrayed, if they hadn't died, if I hadn't lost my job, if I hadn't failed. You see, Satan uses these ifs in your life to derail you. Jesus uses ifs to prosper you. Push past your if to say yes to what God is calling you to do. He's not calling you to please man. He wants you to please Him, to please Him alone and Christ alone. That's your purpose, to glorify Him, which is what we've been doing this morning. And was that not an anointed time of worship? I mean, folks, think about this. These musicians, they don't just jump up here and it just happens. It's the glory of God being channeled through them. So that when they lead us in worship, they don't even see you out here. All they see is Jesus. Because they're bringing honor to Jesus. Worship is a lifestyle. And Jesus, in the midst of his hunger, his starvation even. Forty days is a long time, folks. The medical facts of that is if you've not eaten in 40 days, your stomach becomes distended. 
You become frail. But he was not interested in appeasing his fleshly appetites. Instead, he was only going to worship the Lord his God and serve him and praise him. And he was so in touch and in tune with the Holy Spirit, he could just go right back to the New Testament and quote it freely. And you might be tempted at times to lean into a New Testament-only church, folks. The Bible, the soteriological plan, the plan of redemption, Jesus knew that. Because he was with God at the very beginning of creation when the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and there was nothing but darkness. But he brought marvelous light. God knew the whole time that he was going to redeem humanity at some point. And Jesus was ready to do it when he came a calling. And Jesus needed that wilderness journey just as you and I, we need our wilderness journey. It's in the wilderness that we learn to depend on God even more. It's through the wilderness that he will use the wounds that occur in the, occur in the wilderness, the grief, the despair, the questioning in ourselves. He will use that so that when we come out on the other side, we'll be stronger, we'll be steadfast, and we can help others who are going through a time of turmoil, a time of wilderness to bring healing to them through our own experiences. And that's why I believe Jesus had to do this before he makes his third pilgrimage journey to Jerusalem. As I told the teenagers this morning in Sunday school, this is his third time entering into the city. He's just made his passion prediction to his disciples that he would go into the city, but that he would be arrested and betrayed and crucified. But they weren't hearing any of that or having any of that. He would go in and people would be celebrating him, hoping that he would reveal his kingdom, that he would be a mighty Rambo Terminator figure, an X-Men type person, you know? Wipe away all the enemies of the Jewish people and restore the kingdom. But no, it's in the wilderness that he determined what kind of man he was going to be. A sinless, blameless man. And it's the night that he is betrayed. The night that he's arrested. Fast forwarding three years later when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've been there too. When he prays as his disciples are sleeping. When he prays to his father... Is there a way out of this? Do I have to go to the cross? Do I have to go through this crucifixion? Take this cup from me. Can you relate to that at all? Maybe not. Have you ever had surgery before? Anybody had surgery before? A lot of us. The night before, it's horrible, isn't it? You're anticipating the surgery. You're nervous. You're scared. You're frightful. You don't even want to go through it. It may not even be that serious. Maybe you just have to go to get your immunization shots or your vaccinations or whatever it is, and you don't like needles. SJ, if you're watching, I told the youth group, you don't like needles. That's my son. He's in college. That's why he's not here. He'll be here next week, then. Multiply that about 100 times or 200 times, that feeling that what Jesus was feeling on that night. And so, folks, he knew when he came out of that wilderness, he had a ministry to do, but he also knew that he was born to die. And as he's going into that city, he knows that's the last time he'll go into the city. The first time he was an infant, he was presented in the temple. The second time, he's a preteen. It's his bar mitzvah. And the third time would be his final time. And a lot was accomplished in that week. We could easily fast forward through that week, not do a Monday Thursday service, not do Good Friday, just do Easter egg hunts and celebrate on Easter, and a lot of churches will do that. But no, it's necessary for us to go on this journey to the cross with Jesus, to fully appreciate and understand and identify with how much he really loves you. Oh, my goodness. You feel like you're not loved? Think again, folks. You have the love of the Father. So much so, 
as the numbers of hope remind us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you to the tenth power. He loves you with covenantal love. Hasid is the word. It's a love that's hard to comprehend. It's a love so rich, one is willing to lay their life down for you. And God was willing to lay down his only son's life so that you could have life, life more abundantly, eternal life, a connection with God like never before, to restore that relationship that was lost at the beginning of humanity when Adam and Eve didn't have an it is written. They just succumbed to the serpent, to the evil one, and they gave in. And you see what happened from that. Not good. But yet, Jesus provides a way out, folks. And all it requires of you is to say yes to him. So, when we've come through the wild, like Jesus, we rest. We rest. Part of overcoming temptations is maintaining our rest. Worship is part of that. Now, we need to remember that in worship, as Paul reminds us in Romans, Romans 12, that we offer ourselves in worship as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our way of worshiping. We offer our whole selves. And he tells us to not transform to the pattern of this world, but be not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect, pleasing will is for your life. Paul knew it from prison, and Jesus knew it in the wilderness. He knew that the world was going to offer all sorts of temptations. You're being offered all sorts of things, but he knew, I'm not going to succumb to the world. I'm only going to worship the Lord and be renewed and be transformed. And I'm going to rest when I need to rest. Jesus says it. Some of you are tired. Some of you are weary. And we're not even at Easter yet. But Jesus wants you to know. He wants you to come to you. He says this in Matthew 11, 28, 29. He says, Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will give you rest for your weary souls. He has given me such rest. He has given me such an earnest desire to serve him that even though I might be a little down in my body physically from jumping for two hours yesterday, I'm not going to let that stop me because I know that my Redeemer lives and I know that he went through a lot so that I could get up here and proclaim his word to you, that he could hide me behind that cross so that what I say comes from him, not from Stephen Street. So, folks, I just encourage you to rest if you're not resting. And when you've come through your wild, through your wilderness, and you might be right in the middle of it right now, let me say this. Be ready to feast and feast biblically. Make sure you're in the Word so you have your it is written moments that you've etched God's Word on your heart in a way that it comes to you in your darkest, deepest time of need it comes out of your mouth. And you don't even have to think about it from here. It just flows from the heart, the heart of God, which is transforming your heart of flesh into something much greater than that. The psalmist says it beautifully in Psalm 51 when he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. That comes to mind all the time for me. That is a scripture that I have etched in my heart. 
And when you come through this wild and his, heart, his word is written on your heart and you have this connection with the Spirit, you can step forward. You're on the other side of it. And now you have that word that's pretty popular today, resilience. I am strong. I am powerful. I am more than a conqueror because of Jesus Christ. But without him, I am just a weakling. I cannot do anything. I'm a failure. But with him, I am everything. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Jesus makes his vocation clear. Not long after he comes out of the wilderness in Luke 4, 18 through 19. And we're wrapping things up, but you need to hear these words that lead us into this Passion Week, folks. Here it is. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, I think coming out of the wild in the power of the Spirit, for you and I means we face down that inner voice of temptation in this round. We have had our faith prove genuine and the very least to ourselves. We come out of the wild with a calling confidence, not an arrogance. Because remember, if we're filled with the love of God, as we're reminded in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not arrogant, it's not boastful, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it doesn't rejoice in evil doing or wrongdoing. Love always hopes, love always perseveres. That's what love is. And we have that love. We have confidence in that love. That I am loved unconditionally by the Trinitarian Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And to let the cat out of the bag a little early, beginning on April 16th, when I think we'll do that big presentation on phase one and where we are with all that, we're going to begin the longest sermon series I've ever done. You're like, does that mean long and like length like on Sunday mornings? No. On the Holy Spirit. That's what God has placed on my heart. All the way to Pentecost. You need to be here for that, folks. You're going to want to be here for that. And so you and I will have all kinds of opportunities in the wild, the unpredictable, the surprising circumstances of life to face down the challenger. But you can do it. Did Satan stop tempting Jesus at the end of the wilderness? No, he was just looking for more opportune times Part of it could have been in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is questioning his father, do I really need to do this? Maybe that was the enemy of the soul saying, just walk away, Jesus. You don't have to do this. But you see, the true believer, the true lover of the soul doesn't take the easy way out. Instead, Jesus takes the most difficult way because it builds character. It builds perseverance. It equips you to put on the full armor of God. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about the tragedies that have occurred in our country over the last week or so. The shootings in Tennessee. The soldiers who were killed and those helicopters colliding the tornadoes and the natural disasters, all these school shootings that we read about, and it's, oh my gosh, the list is exhaustive. But I want to tell you this, and I'm speaking from what I know of the pastor of that private school in Tennessee. We've got a lot of private school folks here with us today in public school and homeschool folks that are here with us today whose nine-year-old daughter's life was taken. To let you know, that Jesus didn't come, away, come to take away all the pain and the sorrow and the suffering, but I will tell you this. He came to fill us with His presence and His peace that passes all understanding. Folks, there are going to be evil and bad things that happen. Jesus was presented with that. 
all this temptation. You know, people every day are presented with the choice to deny who they are and whose they are, who they were created to be. Every day we're presented with that choice. Every day we're presented with this and that temptation. Every day we can either choose to be an example of goodness and grace and mercy, or we can choose to be a horrible, terrible example to our children and our grandchildren. We can keep them from church and children's ministry and youth group and God's Word. We can teach them the ways of the world instead of the ways of truth and God's ways. And that's exactly why things like these tragedies happen. And don't you think it's time for the people of faith, for the Christian community, for the church to be steadfast, immovable, and take a stand on the Word of God and the truth of God and go to battle if we have to? I agree, folks. We do need to. And Jesus was prepared to do that because He went through hell in that wilderness, folks, and back. But He made it through. And you know the beauty of that? That the same Spirit that was with Jesus in the wilderness to overcome the hunger and the temptation, the same Spirit that resurrects Jesus from the dead, the same Spirit that hovered over the darkness when creation was made in six days and on the seventh day God rested, that same Spirit lives within you. It's the same Spirit that was with you when God breathed into life, into your lungs, when you were being formed and created in the depths of the earth. He breathed into you His very essence, His life. You're not a nobody. You're somebody. You're a child of God. And He decides who you are and whose you are and where you are to go and what you are to do. And when you surrender to Him and you know to submit to yourself, as James says in James 4, 7 through 10, He says this, Submit yourselves then to God. I think we have that slide up there. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will what? He will lift you up. Don't you want to be lifted up and raised up today? Don't you want to live knowing that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore? That He never changes. He remains forever constant the same? Take heart, folks. You're on the road to fullness and wholeness in Christ. God is preparing you for the next phase of your life, of your journey. He's writing your story. And so it is Palm Sunday. And in John 12, 13... They took the branches of the palm trees and they went forth to meet him and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Hosanna is from a biblical Hebrew phrase meaning pray, save us. They were saying, save us, save us, Jesus, save us, Lord. Any kind of thanksgiving, any kind of praise, any kind of adoration aimed at God could be considered a hosanna in the church. Many of our prayers, many of our songs, if not all of them, are hosannas. Let's continue to give thanks and adore Jesus as we sing about the one who makes a way when there ain't no way. That might not be the best English in the world, but he makes a way when there ain't no way. Are you ready for him to make room in your heart to remove all that darkness and temptation and to push out that enemy of the soul and have a new life, an abundant life? Well, then you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Let's pray. Let's receive Him today. And if you've received Him and you know Him and you need to reconnect to the vine, today is the day to do it. Let's pray. Jesus, I surrender my heart, my mind, 
my soul to you. Forgive me, Lord, of falling short of who you created me to be. Come, Lord Jesus, rescue me and save my weary soul. I receive you today as my Savior. April 2nd, 2023, you are Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for renewing my commitment, for restoring me and making me new and alive again. And it's in your name we all pray. And all God's children said, amen. Let's stand together, church, last song. Let me tell you about my Jesus. singer that had this microphone. <laughs> Good morning. For today's benediction, uh, as Pastor Stephen preached, many of us in this congregation 
are in need of rest. At my age, <laughs> at my age, I thought life would be a lot easier by now. Uh, have a gentle pace, be less complicated, less stressful. Boy, was I wrong. I remember thinking when I was young, as a teen, you know, I thought the world would be a better place in the future if we just could get through the Vietnam War. I was worried about being drafted. <clears throat> if we could survive the Cold War with Russia and didn't have to worry about nuclear war. Then there was Y2K. Remember that? Everybody thought the world was going to end in the year 2000. The tech bubble burst. <clears throat> the Gulf War, 9-11, Afghanistan. The Great Recession of 07, 09. More recently, inflation, Ukraine, hate, shootings, wokeness. To sum it up, this world's a hot mess. No wonder we're stressed out. But Jesus, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The good news is there's a place that awaits us where we will rest. We will rest in the arms of our Savior Jesus for eternity where we'll be reunited with those who, we, those who we have loved and lost, where we will find true joy in heaven. Go from here today, Christians, and tell everyone this good news. Hosanna in the highest. God bless y'all. We love you.